just to kick things off, um, I'm going to throw out some questions to you guys. Uh, open for the panel discussions. I'll have some more specific questions as well for each of you guys to, uh, to address. Uh, but to kick it off, um, I'd like to just get everybody's kind of thoughts right now as far as what is kind of the current state uh, when it comes to uh, media management, asset management, uh, storage, uh, going to a tapeless workflow. Just kind of give me some of your thoughts right now. Where are we? Are we, are we in a good spot? Are we, are we getting there? Are we still have a long way to go? Uh, just general thoughts, throwing it out there. Well, um, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining early morning uh, for this session. Um, so I, I, I think, I think in, in many ways, we're, we're, we've been in it for a long time, but in, in many other ways, we're, we're starting so many different areas uh, as well as we, as we dive into the AV um, or, or broadcast and IT convergence. Um, uh, so, so many different customers are, are requiring the uh, management of, of data and content and what they produce today that is just not the video file and that SDI cable. It's, it's the, now the, the Ethernet and, and, and the storage and, the, and, and, and so many different devices that um, uh, interconnect that if um, we or, or companies like Sony or, or others, Adobe, uh, uh, like, like uh, uh, Sebastian here, um, are not uh, fulfilling those uh, technologies that um, um, uh, that that are required to make that convergence a reality. Um, you know, it, it's 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 just not gonna it's just not gonna be something that 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 nobody's gonna be ready for it if 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 we are not um, uh, combining all the technologies uh, uh, out there. So so where it is today is I think we're we're all uh, in, in a learning state. We all have technologies that uh, promote the convergence, but I think um, uh, we're we're learning to try to put all that together and make it work efficiently. And, uh, and, and that can produce the content and, the, and, and I think eventually the revenue that's uh, required to, to, to put that out there. On demand access at any time, we have our back end users, we have um, those of us who are in the front. Uh, the demands are different. How are we going to integrate uh, the systems? How are we going to make it work for our customers? Um, how do we provide this content? All of it plays into um, how we actually um, get our information technology systems set up for, for our customers and for our purposes of supplying to our customers. Um, collaboration is a big part of it, uh, how we do that. Um, in our business of entertainment, um, as I know in, in video as well as in audio, it's, um, the model has changed a lot. So we do, have, we do need access at, at any time, any given moment to uh, our creative process. Whether we're working with somebody in LA, we're working with somebody um, in Europe, uh, it's important that we have that access to be able to collaborate. And um, also distribution of content. Uh, the model has changed. We, we want to be able to um, you know, get our work out there uh, in several different formats. Uh, how, how are we going to supply this? How are we going to uh, get this to, to our end users? So all that, um, it's, it's, it's changing, and it's constantly changing. How do we stay ahead of it? I think we're in the, um, as far as where the state of our situation is, I'm with the Golf Channel. And the Golf Channel went file-based uh, several years ago. And we did that with a XD cam. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but that's a uh, MPEG-2 uh, 50 meg 422 format, <clears throat> and it's all file based. So a lot of the calculations were based on those types of files, uh, but the volume of files is something that I don't think anyone really has been prepared for. You know, as uh, that starts to grow, the the uh, Golf Channel bought a 2.4 petabyte storage system <clears throat> within two years of its launch. Uh, we filled it, and uh, it continues to grow and can't hold what we generate on a daily basis. They create over uh, um, close to, we did about 2,400 hours worth of media last week. So that's a lot of media. Shoot to use <clears throat> ratios have. Yeah, those just... shoot ratios are crazy because, uh, you know, everything's a four hour um, tournament. Uh, they're very long uh, recordings. So, um, the amount of data that we're generating is, is huge. And file-based workflow has made an incredible um, 
you know, given us incredible uh, access to that media. So everybody has access to this now, which is a great advantage. But <laughs> with that, every time you touch it, you're going to create another file and you're going to create more media. So that's a growing um, process that um, we're still wrestling with and everyone I think in the business is really going to start wrestling with as they get into this deeper and deeper. That, that demand to store that material, keep it, and one of the things that I was worried about as well is that, you know, there are a lot of small TV stations that have historical information that without the funds that we have aren't going to be able to keep that material, you know, much longer either because they've got it on a tape, tape. format that's starting to deteriorate <clears throat> or they have it in a system that's based on hard drives which fail. So there are a lot of... Uh, uh, pieces of information out there that are just going to fade away if uh, something doesn't happen soon in, in those markets, you know? I think you asked where things are at today. I think in terms of technology, if you're looking at um, learning something new, the cost of uh, building an infrastructure for any kind of media management has really come down almost to a consumer level cost. So I was just reading this morning that you could get, uh, I won't say the name of the manufacturer, a 25 terabyte NAS system because one of the companies just introduced a five terabyte drive. You put five of them in this little NAS and you've got a 25 terabyte right. local thing for under $5,000. So if you're in a small work group and you're a creative person and you want to have any kind of, create, no limits to creativity, you go and set up a 10 camera GoPro shoot because you're shooting some sports action stuff and you want every single angle covered. Um, you know, in the past, you would never ever, ever consider that. But all that data, all that all those files need to be stored where everyone can access them versus putting them on your little pocket drives or putting them on one computer. So I think the technology, the cost of the technologies have come down so much that it's really easy for folks getting into media management to look at that infrastructure and start to learn what it's like. You know, nothing the size of what you have, but w without going out and playing with that idea, um, that skill set of being able to manage your media, you're kind of relying on maybe what people have told you. But learning that yourself becomes a really valuable skill. So for us, on our end, the creative side of the, the, um, the loop, where you know, we, for creative types, we don't want to have any kind of management or media management impact the creative process. Right? So I think when the technology gets down to the point where it's almost at a consumer level expense, all of a sudden you're able to learn how to manage all that stuff and then build your own creative workflows around it. Um, because trying to be creative in a fileless workflow, we're now we're file based, but now we're starting to talk about fileless workflows, which I don't know even that term. You hear it a lot. I don't know how that can possibly happen, but that means it's immediate data, and you have seven streams of data, and no one knows where it's coming from. Where's that file? No one cares. You have seven streams of data coming at you from some source, right? And it's all live, and you have to basically cut it and edit it and tr turn it into content that you want to use. So I think you know the technology infrastructure side of it's come down so much that it's a great opportunity for even small groups of people that are being creative to learn how to use this infrastructure and see how that would grow. Because where are you going to put all that stuff after you've done it? You don't want to throw away all the hard work and all the stuff that you've done. Right? You want to keep it and you want to be able to use it and repurpose it and reuse it later. Um, so it's interesting you brought up with some of the older television stations. I was visiting one the other, the other day, and uh, they did have a room filled with tapes and a room filled with stuff, and they outgrew their storage, and now they're trying to figure out how to move it into a modern, so it's, most of it's on near, instead of being offline, near online. Yeah. Um, and it's a real challenge because they've, they've got all that content there that they have to move and they don't want to lose it. So um, any, any terms of um, any technology that can become available to the masses that's very sophisticated, like a NAS that's under $5,000 is a really great uh, thing for you to go out and experiment and play with those workflows and figure out how to manage your own media. Um, that's become really valuable. True. Thanks, guys. So, Ernie, Sony, most people think, you know, broadcast or consumer electronics, cameras, screens. You don't really think about other solutions that Sony has to offer on the enterprise side of the coin with media management, software solutions, storage. Uh, you come from that world at Sony. So what can you kind of tell us a little bit about some of the, the things that Sony has to offer uh, in that environment, specifically with Media Backbone and now with, with C? Uh, can you tell us about those solutions? 
Sure. So it, it's funny because I'll, I'll, I'll talk to people and I'll say, um, they'll say, uh, uh, or ask rather, um, who do you work for? I'll say Sony. He says, oh, oh, that's great. What, what TV should I buy? And I'm like, you know what? I, I really don't know. And, and it's because I don't work on the consumer side and, it's, and, it's, and it takes people by surprise that Sony has so many different other areas. Of course, everybody knows the, the broadcast side, ENG cameras, switchers, and so forth and so on. So I work on the, on the business development side for... Um, uh, solutions and um, and and what that means is uh, that, that we have products and technologies that uh, we incorporate into facilities and it could be broadcast stations and it could be networks to um, control and manage content manage that content um, and that means many many things of course so um, uh, what, what it really entails is the content that it, a, a golf channel has, for example, what is it that they have and how can they manage it and, and, and how can, can, can the folks within a facility look for data uh, or rather content based on the data they input to the system. Um, uh, and, and of course, when I say data, we're talking about metadata. What, what, is, what does that content contain? So the technologies that, that, that Sony has come out with over the past couple of years, understanding media and content and compression, understanding all those elements and putting them together, we've created solutions and systems, technology systems that, um, that, that uh, we call media backbone, um, and, and incorporate them into, into uh, facilities to um, manipulate and manage that content. And we have uh, different sets of software that, um, that uh, Sony develops and incorporate, and we work with third, third party partners as well, to um, to make that whole uh, circle that 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 whole box work, um, so so these uh, products that we've incorporated into the um, uh, into the industry, mainly into the media uh, and entertainment industry, um, has spurred other technologies such as our C uh, Media Cloud solution uh, as well, and that is a, a software development tool. Uh, or, or rather, a MAM in the cloud for management of of, of content uh, as well. So, uh, as as I hear everybody here on this panel, and 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 we talk to so many folks in the industry, there's such a need of, uh, especially for for you folks that are are uh, here at Full Sail, learning about this industry. There's such a need of trying to understand how to manipulate that data, how to control that data, and how to manage that data. Um, and and why is that important? Well, if if you're a production facility. Um, or a post house or, 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 or a network and you're creating data and content constantly and you're storing it and you're using tools uh, like Adobe and others that, that, that are out there to try to uh, work on that data and, you're, and, and, and how are you going to create revenue out of the data and how are you going to be able to use other um, uh, uh, things that you've created for, for a particular piece that you've created, how are you going to be able to use that somewhere else where you're going to be able to um, uh, uh, create some kind of uh, revenue or some kind of artistic value for it. So when we put all these tools together, we think about all these things and, and we create all those front end GUIs and, and tools to help customers um, uh, understand what data they have. So anything that you that's created out there, we can help um, help uh, uh, control and, and, and manage. So, so we have the media backbone um, uh, enterprise solution system and, and that's also incor being incorporated into not only media companies but into business industries as well. Um, when I say business uh, industries, uh, companies like Wells Fargo that we're working with, they have uh, uh, an entire, it's almost like another network but it's the financial industry. So we have so many different types of tools that, that um, help customers manage, control, and manipulate that data for better use uh, uh, of it. So um, many different things. We have development teams uh, here in the US and in Europe that are working on creating better tools for tomorrow. So just uh, uh, briefly, and you mentioned the state, uh, again, Sony is going through such a, a cycle today on learning and understanding, working with customers like the Golf Channel to understand their requirements and, and make these tools so much better. So, um, so it's not only a one-way street, it's a two-way street. It's learning from, from uh, others. And, and having you guys go into the industry, incorporating new ideas into it uh, is, is massive, especially today in this technology era that we live in. Thank you. So, Sebastian, 
Um, I know Adobe has gone through some pretty big changes over the past year or so, uh, offering now software services, cloud-based solutions, yep. enterprise solutions for, for broadcast and production. Um, what can you kind of tell us about as far as this shift for Adobe and, and also a little, bit about, a little bit about some of these new solutions that Adobe is coming up with? Well, it, is, it, it was a huge shift because we uh, transformed our creative software business from uh, into a software as a service, so you, you get access to the creative tools as a subscription, um, where our whole existence on the creative side of Adobe has uh, not been in that area. So uh, you know, take a company that's been around for over 25 years and delivering traditional perpetual-based software licenses you buy, then you upgrade to move to uh, a subscription-based architecture was a real challenge. Uh, but our customers have responded. You know, we have um, the number of subscribers we thought we were going to get, uh, we exceeded that amount. So we're doing something right in terms of uh, uh, delivering value to our customers uh, through uh, a SaaS model uh, to creative people. Because uh, creative folks, um, you know, they don't really subscribe to software. And the Adobe tools weren't available that way. And a lot of other companies So we're kind of on the leading edge. And um, it is a leading edge. It's not a bleeding edge. A technology, you know, the SaaS model has been around for quite a while for other industries. And we've partnered with several companies to deliver it. Uh, but I think it's an education process for our customers to understand what, what that value is. There's several services that come along with that that creative types may never even know they would have used, something that allows them to publish apps in an app store, something that allows them to host all their fonts uh, through the cloud, uh, uh, hosting websites through the cloud. So the transition's been really amazing. It's been really successful. The response from our customers has been really, really positive. Uh, we still have a lot more to uh, education to to do with existing customers who, aren't, who are kind of afraid of putting their stuff in the cloud. But what we're finding is that uh, this model of moving to uh, this platform is allowing us to even create more creative opportunities for users to take their work and collaborate virtually with others. So collaboration is a real big focus of why we are why we moved to what we did. You know, there's a business model to it from a, a business perspective. Then there's a user um, need of being able to collaborate virtually. And uh, if you've got your applications of files on your computer, you're not collaborating with anyone. And today, to get any work done, you're working in a team. No matter what you're doing, you're never working all by yourself. And those folks can be either beside you or they can be a thousand miles away from you. So the uh, emphasis now becomes where's the real talent to get the work done? And that talent might not need to be physically where you are. So building a system that allows you to collaborate creatively, uh, we couldn't have done it if we didn't go to a, a, a cloud model. Um, so there has been a ton of change and we're kind of at the beginning of this shift of focusing on the creative process in a collaborative environment that allows you to do things that you could never do before. So it's very exciting. There's a lot more technology to come from where we're, where we're headed. And then last year uh, allows us to bring out technology very rapidly. So if you look at our, our software model in the past, you would buy a piece of software, you would wait for an upgrade, you would decide if you, uh, if you liked it or not, if it had something that was good for you, and then you would skip or wait for the next one. Um, but if there was a trend in the industry, that would help you be more creative. Um, and we got that feedback from customers. We developed that into the product. And because of our release cycle, you wouldn't see that feature for another eight months, or you'd have to wait for it to happen. But in the last year with uh, the SaaS model that we've gone to, we've had major releases of Photoshop, of Premiere Pro, of After Effects, incorporating features and workflows that the industry is adapting way more rapidly than they ever have. So 4K camera support, all that stuff that you'd have to wait in the past, it's there now, right? So for us, the transition's been really, um, uh, it's fast. For our customers, it's been great because our engineers, they were lined up to move into that. They're free now to add features and functionality and then deliver it to customers immediately and get the feedback loop going even stronger. So I think it's been great for uh, not only the customers, but even Adobe, when they have ideas of what they want to incorporate, that they can actually deliver on those ideas faster than waiting a couple of years for an update to see if it uh, is something that customers will use. Great, thank you. So Don, I know you mentioned a little bit about when the Golf Channel transitioned you know, to tape, <clears throat> went to the XD Camp format. Um, can you elaborate just a little bit more about that transition and, and kind of what were the most mission critical components that comprise your workflow now for, for media management, data management, storage, uh, all of those solutions? Um, well, 
the workflows changed dramatically because, you know, it used to be that, um, you know, given the news department, let's just use those, uh, those guys as an example, um, they need to, you know, ingest something very quickly from an archive or from a, an older tape uh, that would be um, on a shelf or maybe off-site that had to be brought back in and ingested into the Avid, you know, real-time, which most people are pretty familiar with. Um, that process um, was expensive and slow, and you know, since we were moving into a file base um, workflow, because all of our systems have now become digital and file based, um, the transition of all that material had to occur. And so we started a process a few years ago where we we're ingesting all of those tapes. There's 150,000 tapes off site from the Golf Channel from the beginning of the Golf Channel where, you know, of every um, tournament, uh, women's tournament, uh, USGA, uh, LPGA, PGA, there's tons of stuff. So we started a process where we digitize all that material and uh, we're about 30,000 hours into it um, and uh, we have a lot to go. But as people request that material, um, we needed a way to, to find it and view it. So we uh, partnered with a company, uh, IPV, and they uh, developed a uh, PAM system for us, which is a um, production asset management system, uh, which allows you to uh, find the material that you need. And uh, they have a desktop piece that uh, works with Adobe uh, as well and uh, through uh, our systems. And um, that allows somebody sitting at their desktop to view some material, search for it, view the material, and then make selections, and those selections are then passed on to the AVID system. So that's been a huge uh, change in our workflow, and that's something that we're just now starting to introduce to the, that group, and uh, it's speeding up the process. But I think one of the things that, uh, going back to what we talked about before as far as uh, managing all those files in the background and keeping track of them, probably the hardest part is finding them. <clears throat> because each time you record something, especially on an XTCAM disc or on a flash drive or something like that, you're creating an individual file for each one of those clips that you shoot. And so those can be as many as, you know, in our case, it's hundreds of them each time somebody goes out to shoot. And uh, finding that specific file is probably the trickiest part, which is where metadata comes in uh, to play. And managing that metadata uh, was something that a lot of people didn't consider. So when we um, developed, got into this uh, development of the software so people could find material and, and do that type of work, we actually had to create another department which manages that metadata. So I have a group of four people that actually on a daily basis go through and, and cull through the information and make sure it's in the proper place so that individuals who are in the production end of the business can actually find what it is that they shot and are looking for to incorporate into a package. So. There are, there are a tremendous number of workflows that didn't exist prior to file-based workflow uh, that uh, are necessary to maintain the uh, amount of data that, that comes in. And the speed at which people want to work now uh, has impacted that and actually created a larger back-end need than there was in the past. So um, it's evolving, you know? As we get into this, we find more and more things that we need to change and uh, update and speed up and the media backbone uh, piece that we're looking at as well will help us with some of that, we're hoping. So uh, uh, we're still evolving, you know. But you talk about uh, the integration with the creative tools. What we've been seeing is our customers um, not waiting for something to be finished and after to put the metadata in to use it later. Right. So the uh, ability for you to put information about what you're doing up front in the creative process is becoming really important. So in the past, our tools were uh, not really built to be customized to do that. And we created an application called Adobe Prelude, which its sole purpose was to ingest files off of camera cards, but at the same time have an architecture that allows metadata to be attached to it. And what we're, what we're, the feedback we're getting from our customers in terms of 
usage is it's, it's kind of like watching water boil, moving a file from here to there. It's not right. that exciting. Right. But it's really important if the users can develop, if the companies can develop a system or integrate in with our creative tools so it's easy for users to ingest the metadata and log it or put tags in it that are relevant to what's happening while you're actually with the content you're ingesting versus looking at some kind of file name. And then um, you're done. You don't have to follow that. And you're done. That's yeah. right. And our, our goal is to build an integration so that it's easy for two companies to integrate that workflow for creative types. Um, and so what we've, moving to this platform that we've moved to, we found that we have to work more diligently in adding functionality that makes it extensible for all that information to be captured up in the creative process. So you don't see these new features in the software because they're not that exciting, but we have a panel uh, architecture that we're building in, um, in our tools that's HTML5 based. It's very easy for someone to customize, if you know anything about HTML5 language, how that metadata is acquired and even the way that it looks when you're actually putting the metadata on the files. You know, the way that it looks can affect a creative person's ability to press the red button or the green button or this versus saying, tag it with some kind of information that is very generic that's really meaningful later, but not very obvious that you need to do it now. So, um, you know, it's really, our cha the change in our software architecture is that extensibility to make sure that it can talk to all these different systems and the standards that they use to put the metadata in there are still carried along in a little file that you grab from the, from the Adobe tool. So um, it is, it has affected us in, a, in, a, in an interesting way where we're building that infrastructure in our tools and make it extensible so it can actually add metadata in it. You know, just real quick to add to that. So um, we have a system, uh, a media backbone installed at, at, at the Weather Channel, and and it's funny uh, as as we have uh, integrated the system at the Weather Channel, and and if you can imagine, especially the last couple of weeks with the the weather that 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 the northeast northeast um, uh, and even even down south uh, received, the amount of data that they received was immense iPhone uh, pictures or videos, um, all kinds of, th and they've come back and they've said, you know, we've received so much information from so many different people, from so many different, that we need to incorporate new ways of, of, of managing some of the data we're getting and the metadata. So to, to, to the point of um, changing and being flexible uh, in, a, in a system that's so fluid, yet with its constant parts, um, uh, companies, have to like Sony have to have to adapt very quickly to that customer requirement. Uh, adding to to Sebastian's point, that it's 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 always changing um, and and adapting to to those levels of of needs uh, of, of of the customer. And um, uh, while some can be moved or changed, others can certainly be uh, adapted to uh, and 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 uh, modified. Um, so so very uh, interesting. And 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 of course, uh, you always got to be very attentive to that creative. Of, uh, side of the house as well. So they've come to us and say, "Hey, can you can you create a, a GUI that will allow me to um, connect to this device without affecting all the other parts?" No, I mean, I I don't want to say no problem because it's just not that easy. But but certainly we we look at that as a as a changing way and and, and adapting to to needs uh, as we go along. So just a, an example of the last couple of weeks. And uh, container formats will change as well. Absolutely. Which, which each sure. of them. So, um, for example, I know we would talk a lot about video content and media. Um, the audio part of it, um, which is a big piece, and, and I, I think we'll go a little bit in detail later. Um, the metadata that concerns that not only applies to um, the container that has the, the media, but also the collection of the containers containing that media, which at the end of the day, when you have a multi-track session, a 5.1, 5, 5 7.1, whatever it is that, that you need to supply for the video content that goes with that, how do you, how do you tackle the metadata? All that, all that has, uh, has uh, an impact on how to uh, supply that information within that container. Thank you, Robert. Um, and if you don't mind, Robert, continue on with that, that conversation. So I know we really didn't discuss a whole lot about audio uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, these different solutions. A lot of it's been centered around video, but I know audio is a huge role as well uh, when it comes to broadcast and production, uh, music, film. So what, what are some of the big solutions out there uh, for audio, whether, again, it's post, 
music production. Uh, what are these tools that are out there that, that musicians, engineers uh, can be working with, again, that will help them uh, in their business, uh, as well as working with video engineers uh, and production companies? Um, wh whenever there's, there's a collective effort um, in creating entertainment and, and media for entertainment, um, I think uh, the marriage of, of video and audio has, has been um, a big topic to, uh, to this industry for a while. Um, not only because one can't live without the other, but um, uh, also on a level of um, how do we present um, this particular media as far as video with the biggest impact that we can, not only involves, uh, and I'm by no means a, a, a video or film kind of, uh, uh, professional, but I know that I, I, I like certain shots that I look uh, for in, in certain things that I do. And I you know, the people who do that is great. They can provide me with that shot. But how do I add impact with um, my audio to actually enhance what they did even better? Uh, that's where um, the audio creation portion uh, of it comes in. Now, um, whether you're doing music, whether you're doing uh, special effects, dialogues, um, you, you start off with, Ask, asking yourself, what is your end product going to be? And you work your way backwards. That's how you find out what your initial source um, is going to be. For example, if I'm doing uh, a, a tracking session for a band, for example, what is my ultimate um, end product for that? Or if I'm doing a, um, a voiceover for maybe some sort of uh, uh, history channel uh, episode, uh, what, what is my end product going to be? And you work your way backwards. Now, a lot of the times we're talking uh, file resolutions, we're talking about sample rates. Um, those of you in music production, very familiar with, with, with these terms. Um, coming back to the topic of containers and, and metadata, um, not only now are we um, going to have to provide for the the actual metadata contained in each source. For example, I have a dialogue component for uh, this show. Uh, it's at recorded at 24 bits, 48 kilohertz, and this is my metadata says this is the file name, and we know broadcast, broadcast WAV files or WAV files will contain the information that's within there. Starting time, uh, scene take, you can put that in there as well. Uh, but now, I don't only have that one um, dialogue track uh, in there. I have multiples that eventually I'm going to mix down to one that I will supply to uh, my post guy that will put it all together. So how do you put um, that information uh, in a catalog that um, I guess Sebastian talked about a little bit earlier uh, uh, when uh, providing my customer, my end client, with a means of organizing this. And how do I tackle revisions for, for all these? What, what are the, um, the prerequisites before I even touch that project as far as um, what am I looking for for uh, an end delivery on my quality of uh, is, it, is it an HD type um, audio that I'm providing for it? Um, what are the codecs that I'm going to be using or are going to be going through that um, audio, uh, which is a big portion of it. Um, it. As you guys know, whenever we watch a Blu-ray uh, movie, um, there is a lot of coding and decoding that goes on <clears throat> for us to hear that audio in a surround sound system. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty much, we don't think about it too much, but the work that goes into um, actually encoding and decoding that particular audio for that video content is an incredible amount of work uh, that these, uh, these standards that came out are doing for us within that device. So how are we going to provide the best sources for them to encode, decode, and it, it comes out and translates the, the way we want it to happen? Um, the other... The other issue we always have is, um, what, is what, what is the changes that are going to impact our industry the most? Um, 
as far as um, audio recording, how are we going to capture these sounds that we want to come, uh, we want to get to these uh, uh, up on these videos and and productions that we want? Um, it's moving. The trend is very much so moving with um, mobile devices. You know, now you can capture. I'm not saying anything about the videos, but for example, you can capture video on your iPhone. You can capture audio on your iPhone. You can record 24 tracks of uh, a band um, on your iPad using iOS software. So that trend is, is, is moving further and further uh, where we're going to need to adapt. How are we going to handle metadata from these devices? How are we going to handle um, delivery um, transfers? All that stuff um, is is going to be you know impacting what we do and how we do it. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> I've picked up on a word that you guys have used quite a bit already. Uh, the word is metadata. Right. I'm guessing that's important it is. because it's been mentioned quite a bit. So let's back up for a second here. Uh, metadata. What is it? Why is it important? What is the role that it plays from pre-production? to production, to post-production. I'll jump in because I deal with it all the time because the last <laughs> thing anyone using Photoshop or Premiere even want to hear is metadata. And it's data about data. It's simply information about what you're doing. And what you're doing is working with data when you're shooting video and you're telling a story and you're taking a script. That's all data. So how do you quantify that? And metadata is just a, a really sophisticated term of, about data, about, of, about the data you're working on. Um, in, we have a metadata standard that we adopted that was an open standard. It's based on other open standards. So when you're sharing metadata, it has to be shareable. It can't be one person's type of metadata. So for, you know, for Adobe, metadata is information about the creative work that you're doing, being able to take it and embed it in your work and let someone else use it later. Right? That's what metadata means to us. That, that's important as well, because the um, communicating between different devices and different softwares is pretty important in our business as well. So, um, you know, MXF, for example, uh, media exchange format. Format. Yeah. Uh, MXF was a way to um, uh, identify a file and give you the information about that file and what's in the file and what makes up the uh, file that you're transferring or the wrapper or whatever. Um, but different manufacturers have kind of manipulated that into different standards. So MXF doesn't really mean MXF in some ways, uh, which can be very confusing, and especially when you're talking about, you know, the thousands of files that we're talking about. Um, and I think one of the things that came up last year in AB, or maybe the year before, uh, there's a new standard that everybody's trying to, to uh, adapt. I don't know where Adobe sits on this, but the AS10 format would be uh, very useful mm -hmm. for uh, end users like ourselves that, that standardizes it. But keeping open formats for metadata, keeping open formats for file exchange would be a huge uh, benefit for the end users like yourselves. Because uh, when you get out into the market and you see that uh, somebody brings you a, a file from a red camera or a file from a uh, whatever, you know, that's out there, a still camera that's shooting video, um, there's some formats, there's some software that can handle those types of different formats. But um, uh, Keeping a standard would make it, uh, your life so much simpler uh, when you start to transfer those pieces or you want to just make a dub of that piece and exchange it with another piece of software. So that's a very part, uh, important part of this new uh, workflow that we need to all keep in mind when we're working with different types of cameras and things like that. When you have experts that just dedicate, them, dedicate themselves to, to metadata, it's, it's certainly important. And, and when you're, uh, you know, I've been, I've been in discussions uh, three hours, uh, four hours a, a day long just on metadata creation um, uh, or, or, or identifying what is important. And uh, because metadata is, is everything and anything and, and everybody has a different perception of what that metadata should be. So, so obviously you have to have all those uh, guidelines. So metadata certainly will be a, a, a thing um, uh, or a concept of, of today and, 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 and always as we generate so much more data because as we create that data, and Don, you alluded to it, it's, it's how to find that data. Uh, we, we can all create all kinds of things, but 
I really, I don't need, you know, as, as you all know, you go out and shoot an entire day and what do you really use? You know, what, 30 seconds, a, a minute of, of it and, and you have eight hours of footage. So how are you gonna get to that, right? So really identifying that, that metadata um, is, uh, is gonna be so important and, 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 and industry experts today understand that because it's not for the today, it's for the, it's for the tomorrow. And, uh, and making sure that, that that integrity of that data is, is conserved all throughout, not only with Sony, but with all the other pieces that, that, that come into play. So It's even more important than audio, by the way, because you can't look at it and <laughs> yeah. see no. what the heck it exactly. is. So, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it's, it's actually um, organization is, is the key, and we all know that. How many, how many of you that actually... Um, uh, even even live right now, uh, live streaming, have actually done a session and all of a sudden went back and looked at something and said, hey, I, I'm missing this file or it's on some hard drive that I don't have access to anymore. Um, it, it's, it's important that not only um, we keep ourselves organized, but we also hold accountable the... Um, the uh, software that we are using and maximize it to, to our usage. For example, if we're using, um, just to name one, can I name names or can I not? Okay, Avid. <laughs> Let's say uh, using Pro Tools. Um, their file management system has um, tremendously improved over the versions from 6.7 to now 11. And uh, one main reason is the fact that they actually uh, created this whole research and development team uh, on maximizing organization of these audio tracks, which was an important thing for them because they were getting bombarded with questions about, listen, I have you know these three drives on my whole system. Why is my session writing to you know uh, a random drives if I'm keeping it in this folder? What's going on with this? Uh, you know, why don't you use uh, metadata and, and tags to be able to keep track of them without having to write on these um, hardware devices in separate places? Um, it's, so the, it, it came a long way. Um, the first time I was actually exposed to it, um, it opened up a whole new world for me. Um, coming from a software developer background, um, it, it, was, it was very much... Uh, a means to an end for me to know exactly whenever I open up a file then I'm going to store information to it what the header information which is the metadata contains so it will let me know listen this is this type of file um, you can whatever name it whatever here the comment field um, it, it's going to contain this type 24 bits 96k or whatever it is and here's the here's the data stream no different than what sebastian was kind of talking about earlier about streams um, there's always following a uh, what they call a header stream it tells you okay this is the type of file that is going to be coming through this stream read it and then uh, send it, route it to the appropriate uh, portal for you to be able to decode it and then work with it. So that's the way for the future. Now, they're moving it from, of course, our local devices to an unknown place? That's what you said? Uh, some, some unknown... Uh, so, some place. Some place, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Somewhere where it's going to be available to them all the time. Yes, exactly. Where, where it can be available to us all the time. So... Hence, even more important is going to be our knowledge of metadata. Now, going back for a little bit, the, the way I use it um, in music production, um, when I'm, for example, producing tracks for uh, some media production, I would keep track of them uh, using the default uh, software that creates the metadata, and then I will go in and then use some third party that only reads the metadata information and then I add my own to there so I can actually tag it. If anything happens with the file on my system and we all know that if you don't have that system backed up in five different locations, you're not backed up, right? <laughs> if you just have two, you're screwed. So you have to at least have five. So I can go back and figure out, okay, here are the tags. The tags are not matching up. I'm not getting all my files. Let me go check on, on my my four other backups that I have. Um, so it's important that, that um, we understand the, the use of metadata and the use of metadata contained in containers of metadata for us, for music production. It, it, we, we go two or three levels deeper sometimes 
because you have like 32, 64 tracks of, of audio sometimes that need to combine back down to your uh, five or seven or maybe two stereo stems that you come down uh, to when you're mixing that, is, that needs to contain all that information pertaining to all that. Um, so that's, um, yes, there's a lot more involved, I think, than we think of. And companies and facilities, actually, um, running uh, uh, studios, for example, that, that contain archives from all the work of all people that are coming in and recording for whatever production they're doing, um, how they maintain this data um, within their you know, server farms is is crucial to be able to do metadata searches, uh, meta tag searches, uh, to to contain. So, so that's all the technical stuff of metadata. What I like to look at metadata <laughs> is is it's just a simple example. If you have a point and shoot camera and you have facial recognition, how does the camera know that that's a face versus an arm or a foot? Well, in the camera, there's a, a resemblance of what a face looks like, and it's internally it's looking up its own. If data infrastructure to determine that's and then it tracks it, then it allows you to focus on it, and then wouldn't it be great if you can tell who that person is and you put a name to it and it's facial recognition? That's metadata. That's the real life application of the data you need. That makes sense to you because then you take that picture, you put it in your photo gathering tool, and it sorts all your photographs by you know whomever it is, and it allows you to view them. That's the part of metadata that I think for you is really exciting because. If you look at uh, the way that the technical aspect of metadata, it's always like file info, all the technical details that the camera's capturing, you know, um, and there's been a lot of attempts to make it easier for you to collect it. You know, in a camera today, you can put in metadata about what you're doing, your take number, but it's really not the right way to do it because you're busy shooting and it's, you don't want to sit there and tap on the camera all the names. How do you get that information? Um, we have this application that's really neat. It's called um, uh, Prelude Live Logger, and what it allows you to do allows someone at an event or whatever you're shooting on an iPad to simply build up a template of tags. That's metadata, right? Tags. And the tags could be simple. Good take, bad take, horrible take. Good take, bad take, horrible take. And it simply synchronizes on time of day, so it has an internal clock. You can get sophisticated and actually sync it to a real time code generator if you want. Uh, but let's say you just use time of day, and someone's role is just to determine, director, whoever it is, that was a great take, that was a horrible take, that was a so-so take. Later on, and this is irrelevant of what you're shooting and all the gear you've set up and the stuff, the script you're following, all that stuff, later on you can take that information, it's called unassociated metadata. It's not tied to one specific thing, but it's tied to the event. It's the live thing that you're actually trying to log or trying to determine it becomes valuable to you later. Later on in post-production, you can take that unassociated metadata, point it to the files that you know were used in that shot, because someone logged them, scene number, all that stuff, marry it up together and inject that live tagging that someone's done into those files. Now it sounds like, okay, well that could be really valuable. Then you can easily take that information. Once you have that shoot all tagged properly, good take, bad take, let's say it's a sporting event, a goal, penalty, and you can easily have someone generate, you know, highlight reel based on just the tags in there from the live event that someone, all they were doing on an iPad was hitting a red button and a green button, and goal and penalty, right? So it, that is kind of, when we take metadata, that's the real application of metadata, is you don't see any of that. You're living, logging in a human way and ties up to the information you're shooting, then it becomes an amazing way to work. And we're starting to get to that point now where the UI, the user interface, is more human-based and you're collecting this information without knowing you're collecting it, then it can be used later further downstream by an editor or creative person to save them time to be more creative, right? Because you're shooting thousands of hours of footage for a two second reel, and someone needs to view all that stuff to figure out what's the best two minutes to put into that. Um, and without that logging, that metadata, it becomes a huge time waste. So I, I'm excited about the application of metadata in real life scenarios where it becomes really easy and really useful. GPS is a good example. You take a picture, you have your GPS turned on, you know exactly where that was shot, you know the coordinates, all that stuff becomes embedded in the file and somehow you can use that a little bit later when you're cataloging or putting your data or when you're searching for things of where that file was shot. So um, you know that's a technical thing in metadata. I'm excited about the user application of it where you don't even know you're actually doing the metadata side of it. 
That's actually, um, um, just to jump on what he, uh, Sebastian said here, it's, it's actually an awesome uh, ideas that just came up in my head as well for music production where you're sitting down there doing lines and lines of uh, voiceovers and somebody's on a pad uh, trying to say, hey, that take may be okay or that take is good, that take is great. That's, that's a, a great way of um, maybe have a built-in piece for our music production software where we can, you know, m metadata that, that information by somebody, just an assistant there saying, hey, that is a good one, mark that, mark that, and it's right into that file that we can just pull later. So um, great, great idea. Robert, you brought up a, a good point there too, talking about, you know, having an assistant there now specifically logging and tagging things. You know, uh, and I'm sure this is, a, this is a question a lot of you guys out here are probably wondering, like, what are some of the new roles and positions out there uh, that have emerged uh, because of this kind of new convergence with, with IT and, and video and, and audio? Uh, you know, what are kind of the people out there uh, that companies are looking to hire and what kind of skills will they need uh, in those more technical roles? I guess I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, so, uh, and, and I, I mentioned uh, in, uh, previously that uh, uh, we we've, we're working with folks that dedicate themselves to just identifying what that metadata is for a specific environment, facility, network, uh, studio, so forth and so on. So, th those are those are that that that's an example of of of, of folks that are dedicated to that um, uh, to to that to that uh, type of uh, uh, technology or business. And it could be applied to media and entertainment. It could be applied to um, uh, industry documents, data, uh, other forms of data, static data, uh, uh, as well. So uh, beyond that, there there are so many uh, different. Uh, areas I'm seeing, you know, we go into broadcast stations today, and you see the IT guy learning about broadcast, and the broadcast guy learning about IT. Um, um, uh, there's there's schools, and 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 I'm sure here uh, at a full sale as well. There's the convergence of of, of teaching that. Uh, uh, that 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 take those technologies and those different kinds of uh, industry, but we're also working with um, system architects that have no idea, none, zero silch about what an ENG camera is, for example. However, they're involved in discussions of how to create solutions. Um, uh, a content management solutions for the media and entertainment industry, but they don't know really. They've never shot. They've never picked up a camera unless it's the home camera. They've never. They've never dealt with a switcher. Um, but they're experts, and, and they're just incredibly uh, knowledgeable in, in 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 these types of, of areas. So as as we look forward uh, to to the future, uh, some of the folks that I think will be needed, especially. For somebody like a like like Sony that provides this technology, are certainly engineers that understand the broadcast side of the business, understand what it takes for a creative type uh, to do what he does. If he's out shooting, um, uh, you know what are some of the things that a camera can provide uh, or have input uh, that that will make that metadata down the line easier to look for when when that that shooting is happening um, uh, when when that that production is happening. So so uh, and then on the IT side as well, understanding what a, a, a broadcast engineer or or a broadcast person um, uh, is, is doing or will or will do because that is uh, going to be. Uh, needed. It's going to be important to try to um, uh, have those people in a room to try to figure out what, what is needed. When, when you think of the amount of data out there that's being, uh, and, and all of us in one way or another uh, are, are IT experts in our, in, our, in our own respective way. We have our router at home, we have, you know, we'll set up the IP addresses for our laptops uh, and so forth and so on, even though that's not our expertise. But um, as, as we dive into this technology and into a um, uh, uh, new era and, and firms like the Golf Channel or others, Weather Channel and so on, um, they will be looking for folks that understand broadcast, understand what a media file is, understand what compression is, what MPEG-2 is, what MPEG-4 is, um, at the same time understand how to set up protocols and, 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 and try to develop scripts and, uh, and try to understand what, a, what metadata uh, structure uh, is needed out there. There's so many different types that, that it's a matter of understanding all that. So it, there's so many varieties of, of um, 
areas to learn and, and grow in this industry as it adapts itself uh, as we go on. You know, when, when you also look at SEMT standards uh, out there, ITU standards, um, uh, when, when they're trying to understand these, 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 these uh, firms out there, these standard organizations out there are trying to understand the IT world, Certainly, there is opportunity for all types of, of, of different ways to, uh, to try to um, uh, get better or understand what the other side is doing. Um, if I may, um, systems integration. Uh, I heard this the other day, and it kind of, uh, and I heard it this morning, so I, I have to mention it. Um, learn to do the stuff that no one wants to do. Um, very early on in, in, in my IT, uh, computer science, computer technology, uh, music, audio technology, all this stuff, I, I learned a common thread that in order for, for you to make uh, all the things work together, whether you have uh, a gateway router here that needs to talk to these two servers between these two facilities, uh, how you supply data to them, how can you run Ethernet cable to be able to, uh, all that stuff, load up new software, keep up with upgrades, um, it makes you desirable. Even though your thing is video or your thing is audio, uh, go in with those skills. Get your, get, you can get in your foot in the door with those skills. And let me tell you, it, it, it makes you marketable. It, it's, it's, it's infallible that, you know, there's, I, I was looking last night to see what new things are out there in audio visual world. And there is actually a title called audio visual IT designer which you go in and you uh, design the room setups for uh, presentations, whether it is for um, training in a huge corporation or uh, convention centers, things like that. that. That's actually a title. And it involves all um, you, you, knowledge of audio, knowledge of video, and IT. So, Yeah, I, nerds rule. That's what I said. <laughs> <clears throat> Actually, uh, we grew a, uh, exactly, yes. round of applause for it. <clears throat> We uh, started out with like three or four people in a, a small room at the Golf Channel. It was like a patio, okay, two glass doors. And they were in charge of uh, transferring and ingesting all the material into these Abbots uh, when they first started getting into the nonlinear uh, uh, business. And now we have a staff of uh, about 12, and it uh, supplies 24-7 support for all the editing. Uh, nothing goes in and out of that building without <laughs> that group touching it and converting it into the proper format or moving the file onto the proper hard drive or transferring these things. And all of them um, have a, an IT um, aspect to what they do. They all know something about, like Ernie was saying, um, uh, that technical side of what what it is that needs to happen, but they they also have a production uh, aspect to what uh, their backgrounds are, so that they also know the need for that. Because you can have people that know all the technical ends of this. In fact, I think you alluded to it earlier. You know all about you know what port to go to and how to connect up all the uh, cables and do all these things. But if you don't know the importance of what the end result is, it does make it difficult to translate that and get what needs to be done, done. Mm -hmm. So uh, I find that's pretty important. Uh, and then a, the other group that we created was the uh, DIG group, which was the Digital Integrity uh, Group, which uh, handles all the metadata and makes sure that uh, it gets into the right place. Uh, those two groups are crucial. That's uh, another group that's grown. So all the new jobs in our area, um, aside from a couple of editing positions, have really been in those areas. So um, that's where the growth is. The back end of uh, a lot of broadcast uh, groups is going to be probably where the most growth is going to happen. Of course, content creation, it will always be, you know, a need for that. But uh, steady jobs and uh, some of the things that we're doing at the Golf Channel, those are uh, opportunities that are in the, in the back of the office, you know. Yeah, I think the skill set of understanding systems, networking systems, hard drive storage systems, how you share files on top of how to collaborate effectively with others is going to be really valuable. Um, because in a group, when you're working as a team, there's really no one that's 
determining the way that everyone's supposed to collaborate. So I think learning that skill becomes really unique because there's not a lot of folks out there that care about that, just want to get their work done. But without having someone in the creative process uh, manage all of the creative process, how to actually get it done, everything kind of falls apart. So learning how those systems work is really, really valuable. And you may take a course to do it, you may go and get further education on it, but you also may just be able to do it on your own at home. You know, the routers that you buy and you put in your house have all the same kind of firewall setups that enterprise. They're not the same scale, but it's the same terminology, it's the same workflow port forwarding, uh, the speed of the network that you buy. It's, you, know, you can walk in and get a router that's 10 gig E or 100 megabit per second, whatever. All that stuff becomes really important because anytime you're in a file-based workflow, it has to be shareable. And no matter where you are, that information, that knowledge becomes really valuable to creative folks who don't understand that at all and they speak a creative language. But in order for them to get their vision and story told, they have to have a technical expert on staff to be able to help them do that. And it comes down as just even simple skills of managing your projects, file, just naming your projects, putting them in a coordinated way so that everyone can know where everything is supposed to be. Um, you know, all, all those skills become really valuable because all those processes are highly technical when you're trying to communicate a story, whether it's audio or video or even uh, uh, you know anything that's done over time become requires technical knowledge greater than just a photograph that needs maybe color or technical knowledge that needs to be communicated. But the moment you try to collaborate over time, it becomes really really hard to do that with several people. So you know those skill sets they're incredibly valuable because you'll be the you know, the one per standout that says I can set that system up for us that we need for the next two months to share on this hard drive because we're all ingesting these files from 50 different camera types and then we're going to find a way to organize them and tag them together so that when we're done we know exactly what we have or when we're doing it we know where everything is that becomes pretty valuable because no one's going to put their hand up and say i'd like to do that yeah. <laughs> they're going to be like who's doing that i don't know where's that file how many of you are running sneaker net now where you got a bunch of hard drives trying to where's that file and which hard drive did it put on did i back up that hard drive which thumb drive was that on you know and imagine if there's one person on the team that knew all those answers how valuable that skill set would be in someone trying to tell a story or That's record the something right all the time. The guy gets a call all the time someone who knows how to achieve what the creative vision is for that thing you're, that story you're trying to tell so that, that's that's a valuable skill set to have you, you know just uh, to add to that um, I, I, I was I was asked a long time ago to to tell someone what what business am I in right um, I was doing something else at the time but um, um, so so when you go out there ask yourself what business am I in because if you go into a production facility and you got hired as an editor and you say well my business is to be an editor you're 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 done. Uh, you're you're not an editor. You're you're beyond that. You're 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 you need to ask yourself. I'm in the content business. I create content, not an editor. You you create content for something else. When the Wright uh, Wright brothers a hundred years ago went to the railroads to ask for money to develop airplanes, um, railroad executives didn't have vision. They didn't know what business they were in. They didn't understand they were in the transportation business. And by not understanding that, they lost a huge opportunity, and, and, and we know where, where that went. So ask yourself, where, what business am I going into and what am I going to be doing? Because that will allow you to expand so much of your abilities, your broadcast, your production, your post, and so forth, and so on. And that will allow you to say, well, um, I need to learn all these other skills because I am in the content business. I produce content. I create content. And sure, take on those roles that, that nobody wants to take because those are the skills that they're going to be looking for. Oh, you have that background? That's great. Um, so it, it, it certainly allows you to um, um, give yourself a, a more of an edge. So um, think about that. What, what business am I in when, when, when you go out there to the workforce? That, that will allow you to really create um, uh, so many different criteria for yourselves uh, and add to that resume that uh, will allow you to expand. So I have uh, two, two questions. Can the internet keep up? As we go to 4K, as we go to 8 and 16K in Japan already, what's the future look like there? You're having all this content that's now kind of decentralized and it's no longer one person accessing it. So how, how does that look? And your name is uh, Let's okay. The first one. And then uh, my name is Nick and uh, I'm show production. I think it can keep up because it has the ability to grow and scale. So the internet itself is a scalable architecture. And when it needs to grow, it grows. 
So I, I, it can. It's never fixed at a certain point where it only can reach a certain capacity. The capacity is exceeded. It grows to adapt to the capacity. So it's, yeah, it will grow. It can definitely keep up. Yeah. And just to add to that, reading a, 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 a technology document on, on, on trends, um, one of the things that's been put out there by, by the broadcast, uh, 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 broadcast entities is the, 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 we're going to be creating, broadcast is saying, we're going to be creating so much content, uh, AT&T and everybody else better keep up because it's just going it, to, if not, it's, it's, you know, it's just going to break down. So certainly um, the push uh, is, is out there for, for these companies to, uh, to uh, look, look forward to, uh, to creating those uh, infrastructures. Um, just to, to jump off of what he's saying as well, um, when I first started with the whole internet thing, um, way before all you were born, but it was, um, you know, uh, modems, little dial-up modems. There were bulletin boards that we were calling in and doing stuff on. You know, I, never in my wildest dreams did I realize that it could grow to this, this situation. Um, it is about infrastructure. And anybody who's laying down infrastructure, whatever it is, light pipes, uh, laser, um, anything that they're laying down is going to keep continuing to growing. Bandwidth is going to keep continuing growing for them to support it. So I don't think, you know, it, it's based on a mesh topology um, for, for networking. So if, if I send information to one server, if it can't handle it there, it sends it out to 10 different ones or 20 different ones at the same time. Wh whoever has the widest bandwidth to support it. So, um, yeah, I don't think we need to worry about that too much. If, if you know, our ISPs want to keep, keep our business, they will do it. Yep. And then my, uh, my second question is, can consumer hardware keep up with the rapid deployment architecture of new industry standards, specifically to Adobe, how you're continually pushing out these new features and everything, what does that look like in terms of upgrading equipment, uh, especially on the consumer end or you know, prosumer? Yeah. So software typically lags hardware innovation. So, you know, we're in the fortunate side of it that there's new hardware that comes out and quickly the hardware vendors turn and say, what are you going to do to take advantage of these 50 GPUs I just put in this computer, in this phone? And we'll say, okay, great. Now that it's out, we can develop software for it that'll take advantage of it. So yeah, so on the Adobe side, software definitely lags hardware innovation. And um, uh, being innovative, having uh, customers to tell us what means a lot to them in terms of how they use the technology, that's the most important part of what you're talking about. If you don't tell companies like Adobe or Sony what you want in those products, and we don't really know what to make. So, um, and so the innovation will, co will continue to come as hardware has evolved. There was a point where it lagged, where before we got to 64-bit computing, where we had all this hardware that was 64-bit capable, but the operating systems weren't, and all the drivers weren't, and none of the software was. And we've kind of crossed that line now uh, where we've had that established for quite a long time, and now we're in a scenario where we're moving to GPU computing, and that line is being crossed to where that's becoming more open. So software always kind of lags the hardware a little bit. Uh, 4K is an interesting solution because I think that um, uh, if the appetite is there for a viewer to see something in 4K and the TVs get bought and the internet can keep up with it, um, like you mentioned about the internet, it'll scale. There'll be more compression applied to it. You know, things will adapt. If the consumers are consuming it, then the media companies will provide the content for that consumption. And uh, a ton of the growth and opportunities happening around media delivery through the internet, through 4K. So there is, uh, you know, for software side of it, we're, we're fortunate that we can, the hardware comes out and then we'll add, you know, be able to innovate on top of those hardware platforms. Hi, uh, I'm Brian Howell. Uh, I'm in the sports marketing and media group or uh, program. I had a question for everybody on any advice you can give a rookie archivist, like essential advice for moving forward, one that's learning kind of on their own will without guidance? Well, <clears throat> don't feel bad. We're all kind of rookies in, the, in some of this stuff. But uh, I think, um, like we've been talking, uh, uh, keep a um, uh, focus on IT. You know, that's, uh, that's where you're going to be, uh, especially if you're an archivist, you're going to be in, in a, an IT environment. So whatever you can learn about that type of environment will help, will help you. Um, it's interesting, the archivist's uh, description has changed over the just couple of years. You know, it used to be a, a librarian type 
position, and now that's uh, actually becoming more of a technical position, even at the library. So um, I would focus in that area, and um, yeah, that's pretty much all I can say at this point. Yeah. All right, we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Zach, um, in show production. Um, with the expansion of all this gathered data and collaboration with all these users and cloud-based storage, can we expect more standards of tagging metadata um, across the board um, so more companies and users can access that data in a more streamlined um, you know, search logging system? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a challenge. Yeah. You know, for uh, all the different standards that are out there, um, when a, a software application doesn't communicate with those standards, all the metadata that's there is useless. So it is, uh, you know, it's it's a real challenge to make it meaningful when you're actually using the file that's got all this information about it in a in a process in a creative process. Um, you know, it, it 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 it's always evolving, but it is not a simple thing to solve because it's really driven by the users saying, you know, we need to have access to this metadata. Well, why? It's valuable because it saves us all this time and allows us to be more creative. What type of data do you need? So you start, com that's just the beginning of the conversation of why would it be important? And it just keeps on going from there. So it, it definitely is a challenge. Uh, once you have those standards in place, if the, f if the metadata is in there, then how do the software, how does software interact with it, you know, um, is an is a growing area for uh, the creative process and how the, how it takes advantage of what's there. But um, I think we need to get the information there first. It needs to be reliable, it needs to be accurate, it needs to be meaningful before you can build systems on top of it that interact with the data uh, reliably. So we're, I think we're at the stage where we're still trying to figure out how many open standards can we handle? You know, when there's an open standard, how how often can it maybe stay the same for a little bit? And then how can it interoperate with all these different systems? You know, so I think a lot of companies are recognizing that interoperability is becoming really valuable to all of them versus just doing it maybe my way. This is the only way to do it. So we're building in systems that communicate. We're building in APIs that can talk to different systems. Um, we're building ways for, uh, in, you know, plugins to be adapted so the information can be transferred. So we're kind of at the early building stages of that in terms of uh, open systems. So. Um, you know, should not discourage you to figure out how to put in the right metadata in your files because if it's not in there, then it becomes useless. Yeah, and I think we'll get there because you got the FIM standard uh, out there that that's uh, uh, promoting a lot of this connectivity. Uh, you got uh, SEMT, IEEE, ITU. I, I mean, all these organizations are certainly working to try to standardize all that and, and make sure that there is some kind of uh, common format. And then there, you got the manufacturers that are um, working with those organizations to make sure that everybody's talking the same language. So there is not this whole disparity of, of things going all over the place because that just makes a mess for everybody. So certainly the work is is being put there and uh, NAB and, and um, IBC and all these uh, uh, trade shows have all these uh, 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 meetings going on all the time and outside those those shows as well to try to conform and, and work with the IT industry as well to try to figure out how is all this going to be put together. <laughs>